Welcome to Startup Hacks, a We Global podcast. We explore the stories and secret strategies that women entrepreneurs use to save time and money when bootstrapping and building their businesses. I'm your host, Fernanda Carapina, and today I'm excited to welcome Erin Halper. Erin is the founder and CEO of The Upside, a collective accelerator that helps consultants advance their businesses and thrive. Since launching The Upside in 2017, she's advised thousands of professionals on how to redefine the nine to five and enjoy the flexibility and sense of purpose that comes with being their own boss. Erin, it's so great to have you. Thank you for joining us today. Thank you so much for having me. It's our pleasure. I'd like to begin by having you share a little bit with our audience about your background and um, letting us into your personal journey. Sure, I'm happy to do that. Well, I'll just start by saying I, uh, I've had a career, a long career, about 20 something years, and it did not start out the way I thought it would because I started working in the year 2001. So that threw my whole career into a tailspin after September 11th. That was my first year working. But in the end, I landed in the alternative investment space, which I ended up falling in love with. I ended up launching my own consultancy in my 30s, consulted for seven years, had my children during that time, enjoyed flexibility and work-life balance, and then, of course, launched The Upside in 2017 to help other people do the exact same thing. Well, I'm wondering um, if you could share um, also, like when you were starting out, if you take us back to kind of the early days. Aaron in college, when you were trying to contemplate what you were going to do with your life, um, did you always think you were going to go down this track? Of course not. <laughs> <laughs> of course not. I mean, you just, I thought I was going to be the next Sheryl Sandberg. I thought I was going to rise to the C-suite of a major brand and have a fancy job title and a fancy you know, expense account. That was really how I envisioned my life. But I graduated in a down year. So before September 11th, that year was already really, really bad. It was not a good year to graduate. Um, people's offers were being rescinded. There was there were just no jobs. So I really just took what I could get. I'm I, I was in New York City, but I'm not a native New Yorker. I'm from South Carolina. So I had no connections. I had no hookups. So I really just had to do it myself. And then September 11th happened, of course, I got laid off, which then made me have to really reevaluate the whole thing. Now, I will say I always knew I wanted to be an entrepreneur at some level at some point, but I really wanted to climb that corporate ladder first. So I, it was not exactly how, how I envisioned it because I couldn't get a job at one of those fancy companies that I had always envisioned. And I had to take a different path. And remind us again, the different um, corporate positions that you had or the type of work you were doing at the time. It was in finance related, correct? It was. So when I got laid off at, it was a small beauty company. When they'd laid off that department, I reevaluated what was important to me. And after making $30,000 a year living in Manhattan, I realized that money was important to me <laughs> at that stage. And this was 20 years ago. And that was, I mean, that was nothing. That was really nothing. Mm -hmm. And I did not like being broke all the time. That, that was something I knew I didn't like. And I also knew if I stayed in that industry, I would continue to be broke for a very long time. So I reevaluated what was important and trying to combine finances with what I liked. I knew I wasn't going to go into banking or anything like that, but I knew I loved entrepreneurship. So I thought, oh, I'm going to, I want to work in venture capital. Well, 20 years ago, venture capital is not what it is today. It was a real insider's club, really hard to break into. And that wasn't quite an option, but I got into the alternative side. So private equity, hedge funds, that was much easier to break into. And I absolutely loved it. I never thought I would. It sounded very boring, but it was actually really exciting. And I stuck with that for a really long time. 
You know, for our listeners, um, would you mind just giving a little uh, little bit of background of the difference in, between a hedge fund and private equity? Sure. Um, well, they are completely different, actually. Right. They're all in the private or alternative investment space. So, <clears throat> so you have public companies, you know, publicly traded companies, you have big banks. That's one set. They're 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 all highly regulated, but in different ways. A private investment company or an alternatives, you you cannot invest in one of those companies. They you cannot be an investor unless you're a qualified investor, which means you have to have. And it changes every few years, but it might be. I think right now it may be two million. You you have to have a certain level of sophistication as an individual investor to invest in one of those vehicles. And the difference between private equity and venture capital, so to simplify it all, venture capital invests in startups, private equity invests in established businesses, and hedge funds don't really invest in businesses. They invest in the markets. And fund of funds are funds that invest in other hedge funds. So Mm -hmm. that's very, very simplified version of of how they break down. That's great. And what was it that you loved about about working in that space? Well, I I, I have to say, you know, coming from a more modest background in South Carolina, it was very exciting working on Madison Avenue, Park Avenue in beautiful office spaces with people wearing very fancy clothes and very fancy shoes and coming from very fancy colleges. That was exciting for me because I didn't grow up around that. And it was addictive. I just loved it. And I also loved it. They leveled me up in a big way. I Mm. learned so much from all of those people. I had the pleasure of working with people I actually really liked and was able to learn from and have great friendships and relationships with over the years and still do. So of course I love the camaraderie, but I also loved, there was just something about, first of all, all that money, you know, having, <laughs> all, you know, like, I mean, we're talking like billions of assets under management and being at the heartbeat and in the center of that was really exciting. I was like, wow, like we are handling some major money right now. That is really cool and really, really <laughs> exciting. So there was something about that. And also I found that working in that industry, they give people a lot of independence and autonomy. They assume you are smart. Other industries, you know, I'd worked in beauty for a hot second. I felt like very stifled in that industry. I remember my boss telling me I'd have to work two years in that position before I could be promoted to the next position, which was also kind of not awesome. And I was like, well, why would you put a cap on how many years? Like I'm already there. Like I am ready for that next role. I am clearly ready. You even said I'm ready. So why would you put a cap on it? Whereas in that private investment space, like they will push you forward. If you are ready to go forward, they are going to move you along. And it's so results oriented, which is how I work and mm-hmm. how I like to be recognized. Um, I don't want to be recognized because I worked somewhere for two years. I want to be recognized in six months because I made you a billion dollars. And that's how that industry works. So it worked really well for me. So that's so interesting. Thank you. Um, so tell, tell us a little bit about that jumping off point where, you know, those final months when you were working um, as an employee and you started to feel like, okay, now's the time to break away. What was going on in your head at the time? Well, it was less in my head. It was more about my life. Mm -hmm. So there's two parts of breaking away. There's sort of two phases. The first was I left corporate to consult. That was Mm -hmm. the first stage. And that originally happened because I had just gotten married. I had this whirlwind romance. We (laughs) met and got married within a year. And of course, I used up all my vacation days. And (laughs) we couldn't even find a date to get married because I had used up all my vacation days. And my husband or my fiance at the time had his own business. And he did not like that kind of limitation. And you know what? Neither did I. So we made a decision as a couple that you know, we wanted to be able to travel and do all these things we wanted to do before we had kids. And so it started out as a 
frivolous want. You know, I just want more freedom and flexibility and autonomy and control of my schedule. Mm -hmm. And a year later, I was pregnant with my first son. And we found out at 20 weeks along that there was a very big problem with the baby. And mm -hmm. he's totally fine and healthy and perfect now. He's nine years old. He's awesome. But it didn't really start out that way. Mm -hmm. um, he required two open heart surgeries, endless doctor's appointments. It was a big uphill climb. And I was extremely grateful that I had already created and established this flexible business for myself. Mm -hmm. And I thought this whole time I was like, wow, I would, there is just no way I would have been able to maintain a full-time job, especially in private equity or hedge funds. If, you know, and be able to juggle my son's health. Mm -hmm. So it really turned out to be this blessing that I had started my consultancy. I already had clients. I already had a great thing going and I, I didn't have to skip a beat. I didn't have to give up the work I loved. I didn't have to give up the clients I loved. I was able to be there for my son, be there for my family, and maintain my consultancy. That's great. Well, I'm so glad to hear your son is doing well. Oh, most yeah. Most importantly. Um, so as, as so many entrepreneurs need to manage the reality of the economics of their lives, right? As they build their dream, they still have to obviously pay all their bills. And, and that really requires typically uh, working another position, whether it's consulting or a separate gig that you are maintaining on the side, especially early days before you start to rev flow. So I, I think it's wonderful that you've created the, the upside because I think it is something that a lot of, especially uh, more senior level employees who break away to start their own business, can lean on their expertise to launch a consultancy. So I think it's a, an amazing service in general, but in particular, it might be something really helpful for entrepreneurs to explore. So walk us through now uh, the upside and what it is and what it offers. Well, I will also just say that you are 100% correct and that it's a great way to maintain some cash flow. And we actually have a lot of members who have awesome product-based businesses that, you know, you, I mean, I know they're going to be hugely successful and they're consulting at the same time for this exact reason to fund the entire launch because everyone has a mortgage or rent to pay. Right. <laughs> well, maybe not everyone. I think most people do. Mm -hmm. um, so the upside. So I started it in 2017. So I was already consulting for about seven years at that point. And what, you know, a lot of people start businesses because they're just pissed off. And that's kind of what happened to me. I was kind of just pissed off because I kept seeing all these people in my circles, mostly women, leaving their amazing corporate jobs, giving it all up, just giving it up because they had to choose between working full, full time or not working at all. And that pissed me off. I, I, I was like, that is unacceptable. And because I had been in consulting for so long and because I had done it without knowing any better or knowing that it would be difficult or, you know, without anyone telling me not to, it was very easy for me. And I kept saying, why don't you do this? You don't have to quit. And I kept giving them advice and telling them what to do. And we had coffees and I helped all these people. And then they started coming back to me and saying, I'm so glad I listened to you because now I'm making the same money I made full time working 20 hours a week. Wow. I followed your advice. And I thought to myself, ooh, I think I might have a business here. I think mm -hmm. I might know what I'm talking about. And, and I'm really passionate about this. So I decided to launch a company that does not look like what it does today, by the way. I thought that the business model had to be enterprise because coming from private equity, coming from that background, that's what you're trained to, to think. Everything mm -hmm. has to have enterprise. You can't go you know, direct to the person, you know, to the consumer. That's not a business. So I focused on enterprise. I said, oh, I'm going to match consultants and clients because I knew that was the consultant's biggest pain point was getting clients. And I was really good at it. So I was like, I will do that heavy lift. All you have to do is show up and be awesome at what you do. Well, guess what? That didn't work because, <laughs> because when the client said, oh, I want to meet the consultant, well, 
great, of course. And they completely blew the meeting because Mm. they were treating it like an interview. I was like, oh, no, now I have to teach them ahead of time. I need to train them on how to have a client conversation. Okay, fine. But then the client would say, okay, send me her bio. And I looked at the bio and I said, oh, God, no, I have to rewrite the whole thing. This is not right. And then I write the whole bio and send it to the client. And after doing that, I don't know, about a hundred times, <laughs> I realized, oh my God, I, I have, to, I have to go B to C. I have to work directly with the consultants and find a way to teach them best practices and and get the, get their businesses off the ground the right way because they don't know how to pitch clients, they don't know how to write a bio, they don't know how to look like a business owner and not an employee or a mm. freelancer. And so I redesigned the entire business model, which is what it looks like today, which is a membership model where we have members, we help them expand their network with each other. It's very warm, it's very professional, it's best in class, and it's very curated. And then we also just launched an accelerator program for people who are in the earlier stages that like a boot camp style accelerator, it teaches them exactly what they need to know nothing more, nothing less to get them off the ground, making that six figures and yeah, the six figures in less time. And how, um, just out of curiosity, if you have someone who let's say is a pro at pick a, pick an area, let's just say marketing or digital marketing, and they want to consult, um, how long does it typically take after working with you before you feel like they're up and going and, and, landing clients, et cetera. Is there kind of a a ballpark kind of time period that you think is pretty traditional? No, I mean, it really depends on a few things. And that's why we offer three different business lines. I also still do one-on-one advisory for people who are like, you know what, Erin, I know it's expensive, but I just want to get on the phone with you and you just tell me what to do. (laughs) And there are some people who just literally want it straight from the horse's mouth and they'll pay a premium for that, of course, but we offer that. Most people who do the accelerator, they want clients fast. The accelerator is designed to get them there in six weeks. And then the membership is for people who are already up and running and they want to do better. They want to expand their network. They want a support system. They want, I do weekly office hours with all of our members. It's a really... It, it really just depends on what the person needs and how much they're willing to engage. I always tell people, the more you engage in the upside, the faster it's going to happen for you. If you don't participate, if you don't ask questions, if you don't show up to the programming, then I can't promise you anything. All I can say is that 100% of the members who show up tell me they've doubled or tripled their income. They tell me they've got better clients, more clients, it's designed to do that. But of course, like anything, you have to show up. You have to participate. Right, right. right. Well, it sounds uh, it sounds incredible and really needed. And I think particularly during COVID, a lot of individuals are probably considering um, creating a little bit more of um, a flexible work lifestyle, given the demands on, on the home and having kids at home and balancing it all. It's, it's very difficult for, for a lot of women in particular. So uh, allow me to switch gears and talk about the theme of the show, um, which is startup hacks. And, and if you could think back to maybe some of the early days, or maybe even still today, um, strategies that you use to save time and money and gain a competitive edge, um, that you, that are kind of, you know, Aaron's secret sauce, um, whether it be, um, time management or things you do to take care of yourself and keep your sanity going or software services that you use or any of the above. Okay. Well, do we have two hours? No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> no, I, <laughs> no, I think we have, I think we're down to like five minutes. Now. That's a big question, but I, I will pack in as much as I possibly can. Um, okay. Well, first of all, I, before I got into it, before I was just way too deep into the whole thing, when I still had my head screwed on straight, I set a goal where I said, you know, looking at this business plan, I think it's going to take 
three years for it to get to what I think is successful. And again, once you're in it, you can't think like that. You're just too deep into it. So before I got deep, I set that goal. And I said, no matter what, I will not quit until the three-year mark, or I will not even entertain it because I knew ahead of time it would take that long. So that way, when things did get hard and they, I don't care what kind of business you have, there will be very low moments. It just happens to everybody. Mm -hmm. I scraped myself off the pavement and I said, okay, like I, I want to quit so badly, but I'm not going to, because I said it was going to be three years and nothing else. And guess what happened? The three-year mark finally came and I celebrated. I had a party and I said, wow, like I not only made it to the three-year mark, which is where that was my big benchmark, but I'm successful. Like this is how I define being success, successful. And I'm finally there and I didn't give up. I didn't quit. So there is that. Then on a more micro level, I have kids. Okay. Like I'm not going to work. I cannot work 16 hours a day. I don't mm-hmm. have that luxury. So my work whistle blows at five o'clock every day. And that's that. I, I, I don't have the luxury of working nights and weekends. So guess what? I'm not going to grow as fast as some of these other companies. Yeah. I, I knew that. I knew that ahead of time. And so I had to check my ego at the door and set those expectations. Now we've grown every single quarter that we've been in business. But is it 300, 2,000% growth? Am I on the cover of Inc. Magazine? No. But guess what? My business has grown every single quarter we've been in business. It's just going to grow slower than someone who's able to work 16-hour days. I'm not able to do that. So, you know, that was what, these are more mindsets. Mm -hmm. But I think a lot of people, they get into business and they think, well, you know, it's, like, I've just got to like put everything into it. Well, first of all, you might burn out and then your whole business is done anyway. And I didn't want to burn out and I wanted to spend time with my family. They mm-hmm. want me too. And that's important to me. And I had to check my ego at the door. So that, that was, <laughs> that was all a big part. This is not anything to do with time management, but this is a big, big part of what kept me going. Well, it's a big part of self-care, right? Because um, mindset is is all about that. Keeps It does keep you going, keep you sane. So, and I think it doesn't get enough attention oftentimes. So I'm glad that, I'm glad that you mentioned that. In, in the few minutes that we um, have left, I wanted to ask you if, if there's, um, if there's one piece of advice that you would give to an entrepreneur who's listening uh, today, what, what would it be and what do you wish that someone had told you when you were starting out that you'd like to share now? Well, I'm going to give you two things, okay? Well, no, three, because you just asked me more than one question. What I wish I knew, what, what some, I wish somebody had told me that I had to figure out myself is what I mentioned before. It's just checking your ego at the door. It is very hard when you see other entrepreneurs getting awards and grants and on, you know, in Inc. Magazine and all in Fast Company and Wired, you know, that that's hard. So I wish I had to figure that out myself. I wish someone had said, just check your ego at the door, ignore all that stuff. It's all noise. Just keep moving forward. The other thing is know your end goal. Okay why did you start this business in the first place? If it's to get rich, that's one path. If it's to help people, that's another path. But as you make decisions along the way, you want to really make sure all those decisions are aligned with the reason why you started the business in the first place. So that is very, very important. And I remind myself of that all the time, every time I have to make a big decision. The other thing is, for those of you who are married or have partners, having that partner support is absolutely critical. My husband is my biggest cheerleader, my biggest advisor. And when I had to dip into our savings to help fund some things for this company, he just said, how much? And I said, no, you know, I'm, I don't want to spend, how much do you need? How much do we want to put into this? He never said anything but how much and let's do it. And I support you. I believe in you. It is hard enough running a business, but if you don't have that other person's support, 
and full support, wow, it is just too easy to give up. It makes it really, really stressful. Thank you so much, Erin. Um, this has been so helpful. And I, I'm sure that so many people who are listening to you right now really resonate with um, your advice and suggestions. So if our listeners would like to reach out to you and learn more about your company and your offerings, where should they go? Everything we do is listed on our website. It's betheupside.com. So B-E upside, be the upside.com? Correct. B E theupside.com. If you okay. go to theupside.com, you could get some very cool yoga gear, but that is not <laughs> us. It's be theupside.com. Perfect. Well, thank you again. And tune in next week for more startup hacks. We have another great show you won't want to miss on the secret female founder strategies that can save you time and money when building your business. This podcast is brought to you by Women Entrepreneurs Global, the first startup studio and digital do-it-yourself startup platform for women. For more information on our guests, this podcast, and many other female founder programs, please visit womenentrepreneurs.global. I'm your host, Fernanda Carapina. See you next week.